All right, then let's go over the first question here for you. It says the figure shows two situations, and the question is asking this is the magnetic force, that is the velocity, this is the magnetic force, this is the magnetic field, and the question is which of the orientations is physically reasonable? One, two, both, neither. And the last one says not enough information to decide. You have one minute. Please talk to a person next to you. The reason is, what is the reason? Why is the correct answer neither, uh, neither of them? Can anybody answer that? Go ahead, please. Since FP has to perpendicular to both V and V. Excellent. Because the f magnetic force is always perpendicular to both the velocity of the charged particle and the magnetic field. So it's V cross V. So you can see that you cannot have V be at 45 degrees with respect to the force or you cannot have magnetic field be at 45 degrees with respect to the force. V must be perpendicular to force and B must be perpendicular to the force. The angle between these two can be anything, right? Because you can launch a charged particle at any angle you like with respect to the magnetic field, but the magnetic force is always perpendicular to both V and B. In other words, magnetic force is always perpendicular to the plane in which V and B lie. So if V is like this, B is like this, if you, I think of a plane that, can, that has V and B in it, magnetic force will be either pointing perpendicular this way or that way. And you can use your right hand rule, V cross B, right, for the cross product to figure out which of those two directions is the right direction. Is that making sense, folks? Any questions about this? All right, let's move on to the next question. And the next question is, this one, it says the diagram shows electric current that is coming out of the, of the board and the question is what is the correct direction of the magnetic field at point B and at point A, and, sorry, so the first one will be at A and the second one will be at B, okay? You are given five choices, is everybody understanding the question? The current is coming out and you have to tell me what is the direction of the magnetic field produced by this current at A and B. A is first, B is second. Everybody should be talking to a person next to them. What do you think you will do? You, will you use the right hand rule for the magnetic field? This is a different right hand rule from the right hand rule for cross products, right? Here this right hand rule for magnetic field says put your thumb in the direction of current and then your fingers curl around in the direction of magnetic field, right? For the right of the right hand. So for example, if you have a wire that is cur carrying current out and I have to find the magnetic field here and here, I know that if I put my thumb in the direction of current, my fingers are curling like this in the counterclockwise direction. So if I, so I know also that the magnetic field lines due to a long straight wire, they form closed circles, don't they? So they form closed circles and in this case, the magnetic field will be in the counterclockwise direction because that's the direction in which all of my fingers of my right hand point if my thumb points in the direction of current, right? So is everybody convinced that over here then, if this is the magnetic field line, then at this point, the magnetic field will be tangent to the path like this. And at this point, it will be tangent to the path like this. Is everybody convinced that that is the right answer? All right, let's try another one. This one is, thanks Jim, thanks a lot. Uh, this one says, and think about it carefully. This, this is a bar, a metal bar, and you have a magnetic field here that is coming out at you, okay? A magnetic field that is coming out at you, this is a metal bar, that means it has free electrons. Remember, electrons can move in a metal bar, right? If they feel force. The question is asking, what will happen if you move this metal bar with some speed V in this direction to the right? 
you know, how will the charges separate in this metal bar? You know, think about the forces that charged particles feel in a magnetic field. And remember, electron is negatively charged. You have one minute to answer this question, and your time starts now. All right, let's try to figure it out together. And what we will be making use of is the fact that the magnetic force on these charges will be given by Q V cross B. Now you can see that the external magnetic field is coming out at us, right? We have to learn how to put our fingers in a direction so that we can really curl it right. So even before we do anything, do we know the direction of the force that the charges will feel? They better be feeling a force perpendicular to V and perpendicular to the magnetic field. Magnetic field is coming at you. V is going that way. So the force must be either up or down, right? Isn't that the case? Up or down, because that up or down are the only two directions that are perpendicular to both V and B. Now, whether it's up or down, we can use right hand rule. And remember, electrons are negatively charged. So they feel a force opposite. This is really minus absolute value E, right, for an electron. And that's why you know, the force would be opposite to the, what V cross B will predict. So let's first try V cross B, put all of our fingers in the direction of V. We'll have to cross it in the direction of B, so I have to move my hand like this because, you know, see, my, all my fingers are like this, but I can always do this, right? And in this case, since I have to curl it in the direction of magnetic field that is coming out at me, everybody should be trying with their own hands too because in the exam, you'll have to do it yourself. So put your fingers like this, and now I have to curl it in the direction of B. Do you see my thumb goes down? Since my thumb goes down, that means that the direction of the force on the positive charges is down. And that means the direction of force on the electrons is up. Positive charges are, the, are not the ones that move, but it doesn't really matter because if the electrons move from this end over there, you will see some surplus positive charges left behind. Isn't that true? So the correct answer is E because the electrons are feeling a force up, they accelerate upward, and they leave behind positive charges. So the answer would be E. Very good. It looks like you know many people got it right. That's a good thing. I think we will move on today now and talk about Faraday's law and Lenz's law. Please go ahead. The force? Yeah, that's a very good point. If suppose that's an excellent point, again, because of the fact that if bar is static in a magnetic field, this is, let's say, let's say your external magnetic field is in. It doesn't really matter. If this bar is at rest, V is equal to zero, will it feel any force due to the magnetic field? It will not, because remember, charges are oblivious of the presence of magnetic field if they do not, if the velocity is zero, right? In fact, if you have, say, for example, a magnet like this, sorry, north pole and south pole, and you have a charge here, and it's at, sitting there at rest, will it feel a force? No, the force on this, you know, f of b on this charge is zero. Why? Because it's at rest. But if this charge was moving, say, for example, like this, then f sub b is not 0. Does that make sense? <coughs> Any questions about this? Anybody? So it's a very important point that he brought in, which is that you always have to think about, OK, is this magnetic field going to exert a force on the charge? And that, that, that means that you have to see whether the charge is moving, and also, what is the angle between the velocity vector and magnetic field? If that angle is 0, if the velocity is in the same direction as magnetic field, sine of zero is zero, right? 
or sine of 180 is 0. If the magnetic field is pointing that way and the charged particle is moving this way, again, it is completely oblivious of the presence of magnetic field. It feels no force whatsoever, right? So it has to be the charged particle has to be moving at some ang angle other than 0 degree or 180 degree to feel a force. And, and you are right, the, the reason it is so important to think about this is because this is not the way say gravitational force works or electric force works, you know. F is equal to mg, right, the gravi for gravitational force. So the, the gravitational force is in the direction of gravitational field. It does not depend upon whether the mass is moving or not. Similarly, the electric force F is equal to Q times E. If there is an electric field, there will be an electric force regardless of whether the charge is moving or not. Here the motion is important, right? Any questions? All right, so last time we were talking about Faraday's law and I showed you this demonstration which is very interesting. What I showed you is that if I bring a magnet close to or far from say a, a coil which has no current in it, you can see the ammeter right now which is connected to this coil is reading zero. If I bring a magnet close to it, for the time that I make the change in the magnetic flux, that means the total number of magnetic field lines passing through this loop, you see there is a current induced. If I bring this away, I see there is again a current induced. This, this time the current was pointing in the opposite direction, right? Also, the faster I make this change, the more is the current. Look, I am going to bring this thing slower. Do you see if I bring this slower, the current induced was much less. If I take it slower, the current induced is much less. On the other hand, if I make the change fast, you see there is cur the current induced is more. And this stuff can be summarized in terms of what is called Faraday's law. So what was Faraday's law? Faraday's law of electromagnetic induction says says that the induced EMF that causes the induced current was equal to minus number of turns of coil in the wire in which the current is induced times d phi of b over dt. You can see that phi b is the magnetic flux and this is integral b dA times cosine theta. This is the magnetic flux through any closed loop. Now if, if b is constant and theta is constant, do you see that I can take out cosine theta and b from the integral and I get phi sub b is equal to magnitude of b times cosine theta taken out and what is integral dA? That is the total area of the loop. So for example, if this is this loop here, you know, is this wire is circular, the area will be pi times r square, right? That would be the total area. So the thing is, so this is b times the total area. In that case, it will be pi r square times cosine theta. Magnitude of these things. Theta is the angle between the magnetic field and area vector. And remember, area vector is? You know, the magnitude of area vector is pi r square, but its direction is perpendicular to the area, right? Isn't that the case? Okay, one thing that I did not explain to you, so basically what we are seeing here is that B induced can be written as minus the number of turns times D over DT of magnitude of magnetic field magnitude of area vector times the angle between the two. And what we said in different situations, you could have the magnetic field changing with time, you could have the area changing with time because you could be collapsing the coil, crushing it or expanding it or you could have the angle between the magnetic field and area vector changing. For example, I could hold the magnet like this and I could do this. Sorry, I could, so this is like this and I could, see I can change the angle between the area vector and magnetic field by rotating it, right? Do right? you see that? 
and in that case there is again a current induced because the flux is changing there is a d over dt of the angle. So for example if I gave you a problem in which I said well the magnetic field is fixed the area of the loop is fixed but the angle goes from say 30 degrees to 60 degrees in a time of say 1 second how much would be the induced voltage you should be able to find it right and if you are given things at 2 discrete times I also told you that you can do this. If you are given things at discrete times do not worry about uh, you can talk about delta phi over delta t right. So this thing can actually be written as minus n phi final phi b final minus phi b initial divided by t final time final minus time initial this is the elapsed time. What will be phi b final that will be whatever is the magnetic field finally area finally times the angle finally whatever is an initial flux will be magnetic field initial area initial times flux initial uh, angle cosine of the angle initial does that make sense. So you can actually do any problem one thing I have not explained to you is what is the meaning of this negative sign and in order to understand that negative sign we will actually look at what is called Lenz's law because Lenz was the one who actually explained in a language that was easy to understand what would be the direction of the induced current because see I have told you how to find the induced voltage but how have I told you whether the current here will be clockwise or counterclockwise I have not told you and that is what that negative sign will tell us it what it says is that the direction of induced current is such that the induced magnetic field due to that induced current will always oppose the change in the flux through the loop sounds very complicated but it is really easy I am telling you once I explain you know how to do it you will see how how easy it is but basically let me write it down for you and then we will look at example to see what it really means. So it says direction of induced current let us write it like this opposes changes in magnetic flux through the loop. Another way to say it is the direction of induced current is such that it always tries to maintain a status quo for how much magnetic flux there is because here is the thing what you have to understand is if I bring this magnet close to or far from this thing how many how many things are producing magnetic field in this area now yes this magnet is producing it magnetic field but now if there is a current through this loop is that current also producing its magnetic field it is right. So there are two magnetic fields present in this area when I make this change in flux one is this external magnetic field due to whatever thing I am bringing close or taking far but then the second magnetic field is due to the current itself that is induced right is not current current carrying does not carrying current carrying wire produce a magnetic field. So there are two magnetic fields and what that law says to you is that if suppose the magnetic field lines due to this this external magnet that is producing magnetic field through this loop is increasing and say let us say the magnetic field lines are passing that way this coil says no 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 I do not want to see any increase in flux I want to maintain a constant flux through it. So then the current that will be induced in this will be in such a direction that its magnetic field inside the loop is pointing in the opposite direction to cancel that increase that I am doing so that the total number of magnetic field lines here stay constant does that make sense. So let us work through it together let us say north pole do you remember which way the north the magnetic field lines went from the north pole they go out of the north pole do you remember magnetic field lines go out of the north pole towards the south pole inside the magnet they go from south to north right. So the thing is so if I bring the north pole close like this let us think about it the magnetic field lines are increasing through the loop and they are pointing that way right. So the coil will produce a magnetic field due to its own current that will be opposing that change so that the magnetic field due to this coil should be pointing towards me 
Now tell me, should the use your right hand row to tell me which way should the current be? Should it be this way or should it be this way? If we want the magnetic field inside the loop due to this induced current to be pointing towards me, let's do it. Look, if I put my thumb like this in the direction of current, do you see magnetic field inside is coming towards me? So that actually should be the direction of induced current because that's what we want. If the current was flowing this way, do you see the magnetic field inside will be going that way? And that's not the case. Does that make sense? Okay, now what do you think will happen if the opposite thing, if I do the opposite, by the way, if I hold this thing for some time, this coil go, gets used now to having some magnetic flux passing through it. That means it, it gets used to having these magnetic field lines through it. It says, okay, I give up. I'm not going to oppose anymore. I'm not going to resist anymore. Now, if I want to remove this thing, I say, oh, let me yank it out. It says, no, no, don't take it away. I like the flux through it. So this time it will induce a current in it that will try to replenish the magnetic field that you are trying to get rid of. Do you see? Because you are decreasing the flux through it this time. It always likes to keep a status quo. So it resists for the period of time that you are making the change. And once you have stopped making the change, the induced current goes to zero because this coil stops resisting. You know, one good example I think is, you know, when I try to put my kids to bed, what happens is that, you know, they'll say, oh my gosh, it's only 10 o'clock, you know, they'll be like, they'll be opposing so much, they'll be like, no, no, it's not time to go to bed. But when you say, no, look, you have to go to school, you yank them and put them in bed, within no time, you know, so the resistance is there while they are being put in bed. So over that period of time, they want to maintain the status quo, they want to keep playing. But once they've been put in bed, immediately they fall asleep. Similar thing happens when you try to yank them out of bed in the morning, you know, because they don't want to wake up. So again, they're used to that status quo of, you know, being under the blanket. When you pull them out, they're resisting, resisting, resisting. But, you know, once they, you, they, they really are standing and they're out, the resistance goes away. So in this case, if the North Pole was pointing that way and the, it was used to it like this, if I pull the North Pole out, which way will the induced current be if it tries to maintain a status quo? See, if it tries to maintain a status quo and it's seeing now that the North Pole, remember, North Pole has magnetic field lines going that way, right? And we are decreasing that flux as I'm taking this thing away. So that means the coil will try to produce current that is producing a magnetic field inside the loop in that direction to replenish what you have taken away. So that means, tell me which way should the current be? Should it be this way? Because look, if I put my thumb in the direction of the current, the magnetic field here is pointing this. Remember, magnetic field lines will form closed loops like this. And I only care about inside. So do you see, put my thumb like this here inside this loop, from in this region, the magnetic field will be pointing that way. So in other words, this time the current should be flowing opposite. Is that making sense, folks? So in all situations, the induced current will try to maintain a status quo. Also note that the induced current will only last Induced current is obviously, you know, this V induced over R, the resistance in the coil, whatever is the resistance of that copper coil, but induced current will only last for the period of time when you have a flux changing, right? As soon as you hold this thing stationary, you know, only for the period of time that I'm making the change, there is an induced current. Once I hold it stationary here, nothing happens. So what is important is not the flux, but the change in flux. The coil only opposes this, cha this change in flux because it gets used to having a constant flux through it. Is that making sense, folks? Suppose you have a wire which is in a magnetic field that is pointing into the board, and these crosses are actually getting stronger. So B external is increasing. The question that I have for you is, Please use Lenz's law to tell me whether the current here should be clockwise or counterclockwise. Does that make sense? Please work with the person next to you. So the question is, if B external is actually getting stronger and stronger, notice that same thing will happen here. Inside the loop, it's getting stronger and stronger. What do you think will be the direction of induced current, which always tries to maintain a status quo? So the first thing that you should be thinking is inside the loop, should the magnetic field due to the induced current be pointing towards you or towards the board? 
And then you can use your right hand rule too, you know, the right hand rule for the magnetic field to figure out which way should be the current. So do it with the person next to you, please. people think it should be counterclockwise that is actually the right answer it should be counterclockwise because think about it if one thing is so, so this is how you should reason B external is increasing right I don't care about outside the loop the only place I care about is inside the loop right so it's it's increasing and I see its crosses that means this is the B external which is crosses that means B induced due to the induced current these, this, these arrows are showing direction of induced current. There will be a B induced inside the loop that should be dots. And so the question is, should I be, should the current be clockwise or counterclockwise? Use your right hand rule now. If you put your thumb in the direction of current, you can see the magnetic field here is going in and here coming out. If you put your thumb in the direction of current here, it's going in, here it's coming out. You put it here, your thumb is going that way. Magnetic field outside is going in inside coming out do you see inside it's coming out it's dots and that's what we are expecting because we want to because this coil wants to maintain a status quo so it wants to decrease the total magnetic flux so you can see that these crosses some of these crosses will cancel some of these dots to try to maintain a status quo for the period of time that you're making a change if you don't make a change you know if you stop making changing this suppose b external becomes constant at some moment what will happen at that after that time? Will the induced current go to zero? Yes, and, and the induced magnetic field, all these dots will go away because they are due to the induced current. So the induced current will go away if the magnetic flux was constant, it was not changing. Because only when the magnetic flux is changing with time, only then there is an induced voltage and induced current. And the direction we can figure out using this Lenz's law, right? Okay, try one more example here so let's say that you know we have some one some region where the magnetic field is coming out of the board this is the B external I have a coil that is initially being pushed in so it's half outside half inside and it's moving with the velocity V then it's at some point it's over here again moving with velocity V and at some point it's leaving still with velocity V I want you to tell me what would be the induced current in this coil here, here, and here, all these three cases. Does that make sense? Please talk to a person next to you. So the question is, which, which way should be the direction of induced current in each of these cases? There are three different cases. Just do one at a time. Do the first one first, then the second, then the third. Please talk to a person next to you, please. Sorry? Oh no, 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 no. The big, big circle is just a region in which a uniform magnetic field is there, which is coming towards you. So the, so the, the point is that there is no, mag no external magnetic field here. The external magnetic field is just here. Think about this is some region which is, you know, which has Helmholtz coil around it, so that there is a uniform magnetic field coming at you. So this is the only region that square just shows you a region in which there is magnetic field, some external magnetic field, elsewhere it is not there. Okay. So anybody has any thoughts on which way should be the induced current here? How many people think clockwise? 
Okay, that is actually the right answer because let us think about it. What is happening? Is the flux through this loop increasing the external flux? Yes, because you know, as this coil is pushed more and more, you can see that the area of this coil that is in this magnetic field is increasing. So the coil C is that the flux through it is increasing as it is being pushed in because this much is out and this is in and as you push it in, this more and more of it keeps getting in, right? right? So if it sees that it is increasing and, it, and the magnetic field is pointing out at us, the external magnetic field, the induced current should produce its own magnetic field that should be pointing into the board, right, inside the loop. And if I put my thumb in the direction of current, you can see if the current is flowing clockwise, then the magnetic field inside the loop will be crosses going in, right. So the induced, this should be, the crosses are showing be induced Due to, due to this I induced that is pointing in the clockwise direction. Any questions about that? Okay, what about if it is going here from, from here to here? Any induced current? No, the induced current is 0 here. Why? Because the thing is because even though the coil is moving, the magnetic flux through it is not changing because B external is uniform and you know as many field lines were passing here as here, as here, right? Does that make sense? Okay, what about over here? Should this be counterclockwise this time? Yeah, this will be counterclockwise because you know the coil over here got used to being in this external magnetic field. Now you're pulling it out and it says, no, I, I don't want to be pulled out. Please leave me in that magnetic field. And so in this case, it opposes the decrease. So this time it tries to replenish what you are getting rid of by pulling it out. So external magnetic field, is this dots, this is external and the thing is the induced magnetic field should be in the same direction, right? So that the total is maintained, so B induced should be in the same direction and you can see if you use your right hand rule for the magnetic field, you will see if you put your thumb in the direction of the current, outside it is crosses, I do not care about outside but inside it is going to be dots. And that's what I want because this time the coil is replenishing the external magnetic field that is decreasing, right? Any questions about Lenz's law? All right, then uh, do you know that Faraday's law of electromagnetic induction is extremely important? I mean, it has so many applications, you'll be amazed. Can you think of some application of this law? Do you know any application? For example, I mean, let's start with some really mundane ones. For example, in electric guitar, you know, the current in the strings is produced because there is, <clears throat> when you pluck the string, there is a magnet close to it. And so the thing is, when the string is plucked, do you see, I mean, since it is getting closer or farther from the magnet, the magnetic flux through the thing is changing and hence there will be an induced current. But that is one mundane example, okay, one example that is really important that we are going to talk about a lot is what is called transformers. Are you guys familiar with transformers? What do transformers do? Do you know what transformers do? They change what? Yeah, they change the voltage. They change the potential difference. So for example, do, uh, do you know one of the reasons, one of the main reasons why the kind of electricity that we get in our house is not the kind of electricity that always flows in the same direction. That kind of electricity is called direct current, right? Electricity. On the other hand, the kind of current that we get is what is called alternating current. This is a current that can change, that changes its direction. You know, it could be 50 hertz or 60 hertz depending upon which country you are in. That means 50 times every second it will change its direction. The question is why do you want the current to be changing direction? What advantage does it give us? One of the major reasons why we use alternating current, the current that changes direction is to take advantage of Faraday's law. Because you know, can you think, just think about it, you know, if, if you have changed current that is changing direction, do you think that the magnetic field associated with that current is also changing direction? Isn't it? Half the time the magnetic field is one way and half the time it is the other way, one way or the other way. So the magnetic field is changing its direction and so the magnetic field is changing and you can take advantage of the, of Faraday's law to make some device called transformer that will actually change the voltage to whatever value you want. So for example, the, 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 do you know what is the 
potential difference or voltage of the regular power uh, supply that we have in our houses? It's 120 volts, right? But the thing is, if I'm using a hair dryer, hair dryer requires maybe three volts. It doesn't require 120 volts. So how do you change 120 volts to three volts? It turns out you can use this device called transformer and you can make use of this law, as we will see in this course, to bring down the voltage from 120 volts to three volts. If I'm using a TV which has an electron tube in it, in order to accelerate those electrons, you know, so that they hit the screen and I see all this, you know, colorful things because the electrons are bombarding at different places and I see this flash and I can read things and see pictures. I need very, very high voltage, you know, thousands of volts or kilovolts even. And the question is, how do I increase 120 volts to that kind of a voltage? I can use a transformer. These transformers are built into your TV that will actually increase the voltage in this case from 120 to that, that, that thing. So the point is, in different applications, we need different voltages. And that can be done making use of this Faraday's law if we use transformers. OK, another very exotic usage would be uh, magnetically levitated trains. Are you guys familiar with <coughs> magnetically levitated trains? Magnetically levitated trains are also based upon Faraday's law. So in this particular, you know, what happens in magnetically levitated trains is that in the train itself, you have a huge magnet. You have a huge magnet in the train. And what happens is that the tracks are made of some metal, right? As the train is, pa as the, when the train starts, what happens is that the magnetic flux through those rails is changing, magnetic field lines, and there are these induced currents in these tracks. And th what that does is actually repels the train itself, the, the metal in the train itself. Let me actually show you why that would happen. So let's try to actually look at an example and see why would there be a repulsion and why would there be lifting? Think about it like this. So let me just try to put a 3D picture. So suppose I bring a north pole of a magnet, let's say, close to a coil, right? The magnetic field lines due to the north pole are, let's say, pointing like this, right? And if you bring it closer to this loop, what's happening? If the velocity is this way, is the flux increasing through the loop? Yes, it's increasing. This coil will induce induce a current in it, induce a voltage, that is the, indu the EMF, induce EMF, and it will induce a current in s corresponding to it, right? V induced and I induced. The current induced and voltage induced are re really related by this R factor, the resistance of the coil, such that it tries to maintain a status quo. Let's use our right hand rule. Look, if the current is flowing in the, this direction, you can see the magnetic field due to the induced current, right? will be pointing up. I don't know if I'm giving a three-dimensional view. I'm just saying if the coil is like this over here, if I bring the thing from up, do you see that the current should be flowing, say, this way, so that the induced you know, magnetic field is pointing like that way? So this is the you know, B induced due to the I induced. So then you have B external, and you have B induced that are pointing in opposite directions. Now here is the thing. You can think of a current carrying coil as a magnet itself. Isn't the current carrying coil a magnet in itself? Now the thing is, for a bar magnet, we already know. So let me just stop for a second and let me remind you what a bar magnet was like. So if you have this north and south, field lines will go out of north towards south and then back again, back again. So these are the field lines, right? Right? Does everybody agree with that? These are the field lines. What about for a current loop? Think about a current loop. If I have a current loop, suppose it's like this. You know, so the current is flowing like this. So I can see the magnetic field lines are going this way. Do you see that the magnetic field lines are kind of, you know, obviously the magnetic field lines will form closed loops here as well. You know, something like this. So does everybody see this is for the current that is flowing in this coil in this direction? This is some I. So if you had to make an analogy between this and this, think of this coil here 
you know, the, the, the region of the coil to be this region here of the magnet. So can you tell me which side should be thought of as the north and which side should be thought of as the south pole of this current carrying coil? What do you think? What should I think of this side versus the top side? Huh? Looking at this analogy, would you say that this is like North Pole and this part is like South Pole? Wouldn't you? So the same exact thing holds here as well. When you have a current induced like this, do you see that this part has, this current carrying wire is such that the upper side is behaving as a North Pole, the lower side is behaving as a South Pole? Isn't it? Does that make sense? So effectively then what you have done, as you bring this magnet closer and closer, you have induced a north and south pole because of this induced current. And do you see north is close to north, so these two things are repelling? Do you see north of this magnet that is being brought close to this current loop that is induced this current is closer to the north pole that is induced due to this coil behaving as a magnet. And so if north and north are closer, would you say that the force between them will be repulsive? They will repel each other? Wouldn't you? And this is exactly what happens in magnetically levitated train. Uh, in Pittsburgh, we were thinking of having it. Did you, did you guys know that we, were think we had a plan of you know, trying out magnetically levitated trains? Of course, because of the budget cuts and everything, it never materialized. So only Japan and Germany have tried it. Did you have a question there? Yeah, so, but of course it never happened here. But the idea is that there will be effective repulsion between this magnet and the rails in this case, right? Here is a very, very nice demo. This is one of my favorite demos in this class, literally my favorite, I should say. And here is the thing. Let me ask you to predict what should happen. So I have this, you know, metal tube here. It's hollow. And I am going to drop two things from it. One, and they are exactly the same weight. The only difference is that one of them is a magnet and one of them is not. So one is a magnet, one is not. I want you guys to think about what do you think will happen if I drop a magnet through this tube going down and what will happen if I drop a non-magnet which has the same weight. Can you talk to a person next to you? Oh, I want you to think about two things. What happens, by the way, that is a uh, scale, you know, spring meter that will read basically the downward force that is acting on this tube. And I also want you to think about, so right now, for example, the only downward force is the gravitational force on it. So basically, you, you can see that uh, about 7 Newton is the weight of this, you know, this tube. Do you expect that downward force also to change when these things are passing, and if maybe one of them is passing, maybe not when the other one is passing. But the question is, what should happen to that force? And what do you expect the time for these things to go down? Please talk to a person next to you, and then we'll sh I'll show you the demo. Any thoughts, folks? Anybody wants to share their opinion? It's a friendly class. Come on, folks. Anybody? Any guesses? Tell me what you think about the time. Because it's going to be pretty drastic. Did you want to get it, make a try? Huh? Anybody? Go ahead, please. Sorry, what did you say? The magnet will take longer. OK, let's try and see, because he's absolutely correct. What you will see is that magnet will take a lot longer. Let's first try this, uh, you know, this thing that is non-magnetic and see how long it takes. Oh, actually, this is magnet. That is magnet also. <laughs> you can see the fact that it's taking that long. It says that that is a magnet. OK, let, let's try this non-magnet. Oh, that is magnet too. <laughs> Wait, what happened? I think maybe this is the only one that is not a magnet. OK, you saw how long those things took. Do you see how quick this was? So this one, 
It's very quick. But it's, yeah, these things are sticky. So you can see. You see how long it takes for this thing to come down? Now it came down. On the other hand, it doesn't take any time at all. Let's try this one. Okay, that is actually not a magnet. The one that I thought was a magnet is actually not a magnet. All right, so at least using this experiment, you can tell whether it's a magnet or not. So how is it that we were able to tell using this experiment whether it's a magnet or not? Again, the principle at work is exactly this. What is happening is that as the magnet is passing through it, you know, in different parts, there is this induced current here. And that induced current, because, you know, do you see that the magnetic field through this part, this part will keep changing as that magnet gets closer and closer to different parts, right? And because of that, there will be an induced current and that will oppose, you know, that will repel the magnet itself. And so if the magnet is being repelled, it will take longer to go down because the only, if you draw its free body diagram, not only is the gravitational force mg acting on it, you have to draw an upward force, which is this magnetic force of repulsion on the magnet, right? So the, the net force, which is due to gravity and the magnetic force will be much slower and hence it's taking longer, right? Isn't that true? So acceleration will be a lot smaller, please. I mean, I think maybe what you're trying to say is, you know, what is happening on the top part versus bottom part, right? That's what you're trying to say. I, I, and actually, that is a good thing to, to, to look at also. But it turns out that overall, so, so the other question is this. Sorry. So let's say that, you know, you have a coil over here, right? And let's say that this thing, we had this particular magnet. And this time now, this is the North Pole, this is the South Pole. This time I'm taking this thing away. From, from this coil, say, say that region there, right? So in this case, you can see that now North Pole is like this, but notice what where the South, South Pole has magnetic field lines going like this towards it, right? Okay, so the thing is, so if that is the case, now at this moment, what has happened? So if the magnet has moved away from a certain region, then in this case, what do you think will happen? Again, now what you see is that South Pole has magnetic field lines going down, and it's going away further. So it will, the current here will be such that it has its magnetic field pointing which way? In the same direction, right? Do you see this should be the B induced? This is the B external due to this, by B external I mean due to this bar magnet. So B induced should be like this also. And which way should the current be? If you look at the direction of the current, that should be this way. This, is, this should be the I induced that will produce the B induced that is pointing like this. Do, do you see? So using this thing that we talked about, which way should the South Pole be and which way should the North Pole be? South Pole is where the tail of these field lines is and North Pole is you know, towards the head. So which way should, the, should this be like South Pole and this should be like North Pole? It is, right? If you look here, actually there is a, an attraction between the receding magnet and the North Pole that is generated. So you are right, it's not repulsion, but rather attraction. And I think maybe that's what you're mentioning. So what you're saying is that if suppose the magnet has moved away like this, it's moving down, right? Over here, if you look on the top from where the magnet has moved away, this thing is actually being attracted to that thing, right? On the other hand, it's being repelled by this part. part. But if you look at the overall effect, it's both in the same direction. Do, 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 you see, do you see, I mean, if you, in, so that's a really good point that it's true that when the magnet moves away, again, due to Faraday's law, the flux through this thing now is actually decreasing through this to top, you know, some, some part over here is decreasing if the magnet is now moving away and that tries to actually replenish it, right? So this time actually you will generate a North Pole closer to South Pole, which will attract it. But if you look at the, what is the effect of that North Pole? It's trying to pull it up, right? And here you are repelling, which is going, which is again pulling it, you know, pushing it upward. So the overall effect is pushing it upward. And that's what I was showing you. Go ahead, please. Would you get shocked if you uh, touch that pipe? No, there is no shocks here at all. So the thing is, so the shocks, you know, you will get if you are dealing with Van de Graaff generator, things that have charges. We are not talking about any charges here. 
there is no charge accumulation anywhere we are talking magnetic effects these, these are all you know neutral things charge neutral things all we are talking about is current induced you know when there is current in some part of the wire the wire overall is still neutral isn't that true all that is happening is that electrons are slowly drifting as the current is induced but there is no charge but that is a good point too please. No, what I said is that look at the south pole here. So I am talking about what his point was, let us understand different points because we have to consider two different things. One is we can think of a loop here, right? You can think of a little metal loop here and you can think of a metal loop here. So the question is as the magnet is moving, it is getting closer to these ones and it is going farther away from these ones. So he was asking what will be the effect due to these ones, right? Isn't that what you were asking? And what we already concluded that if you get closer to something, you definitely see repulsion. That's what we were saying. Now the question that I didn't address earlier was, which I address right now, is what happens if the magnet is moving farther from a current loop? That's what I was trying to show here. Let me show it one more time. So here is a current loop. Here is a loop, not current. It doesn't have any current right now. But if suppose I, um, uh, I have a magnet that is moving farther from it and if south pole is the one on the top which is what it is let's say you know it doesn't matter we can reverse the whole thing and the answer will still come out to be a repulsion the point is if the south pole is moving away south pole has magnetic field lines going in so tell me what would be the magnetic field you know this is the external magnetic field and as you move the magnet away this external magnetic field is getting weaker so what do you expect to be the induced magnetic field because the thing is if the, if the external magnetic field is pointing this and the magnet is moving farther and farther away isn't the external field getting weaker so the induced magnetic field should be in the same direction to replenish it right shouldn't it maintain a status quo so in fact B induced should be in the same direction and if B induced is in the same direction the question is what you know use your right hand rule for magnetic field to figure out which way should be the current and you can see the current should be in this direction that's what I was trying to show so this is basically these two are duplicates of each other I just did it a second time because it's getting messy and it's hard to see and so that's why I showed you that the current is flowing that way if the current is flowing that way and the magnetic field is pointing down do you see that this thing here is north of this loop if you think of the loop as a magnet, this part became north and this part became south. Would you say that? So if, if I gave you a loop like this and I told you that the current in this loop is like this, right? And the magnetic field due to this current inside the loop is pointing like this. Wouldn't you say, looking at this analogy here, that the south pole would be <coughs> this part and the north pole would be this part? Would you say that? So south, north. And then I'm saying that this north will be attracted by the south. That means the current carrying coil, which is acting like a magnet, is attracting the bar magnet. But then this attraction is upwards. That's what I'm trying to say. That here, even though this thing has receded and all these things are actually attracting this magnet, they are attracting it upward. And that upward is still the same as what will happen due to the repulsion due to all these loops here, which will lead to a force upward. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? I mean, it's it's it, the concept is not that difficult to understand. If somebody is pulling you, you know, if if you are being repelled by something from here, wouldn't that exert a force you on you upward? And if you're being attracted by something over there, that will exert a force on you upward also. So the net force on this is upward, and that's all that we are talking about. And here I showed you what will happen due to all the parts to which you know for which it's getting closer and. Here I showed you these two are identical drawings that show what happens due to the parts from which it, this magnet is getting farther and farther. In one case it's attraction, the other case it's repulsion, but both of them point in the same direction and hence the net magnetic force is upward. Now also I wanted to point out that from Newton's third law, if the force on this due to the current in, the, in this tube is pointing upward, from Newton's third law, shouldn't this tube feel a force in the downward direction due to this magnet? It should. So the magnetic force on the tube due to the magnet should be downward because this magnet is being repelled upward 
from the tube. And so what should happen to the reading there? It should, it should increase because not only is mg acting down, the gravitational force, but there is also an additional force which is magnetic which is due to the repulsion with this. Let's try and see. Now read, look at the reading as it's going down. I don't know if, if it's so easy to see the reading. Did you see the reading change? So the reading should have increased at least and that will actually, t if you look at the change in the reading, that will tell you how big the magnetic force is. Okay. Any questions about this folks? Anybody please? That is a good question and again we are saying if you, if you draw a free body diagram of the magnet, let's say that this is my magnet. If I draw its free body diagram, how many forces are acting on it? And this mg acting down, that's the gravitational force or the weight of this thing. And there is this magnetic force F of B that is acting upward due to induced current. Right? Okay, here is the thing. When will the object move at a constant velocity? It will move at a constant velocity when the magnetic force becomes exactly equal to <coughs> what? Mg, right? Do you see that? When I drop this thing from rest, you know, and the flux is changing, initially the acceleration will not be zero. So initially what I'm trying to say is that look, if you want to find the net force on this thing, in the downward direction, let's say this is my positive y direction, then do you see that F net here is mg minus F of b, right? Isn't that what it is? If F of b is upward and mg is, which is the weight which is acting downward. So then if that is the case, what you, in general you will get an acceleration, that means the velocity is not constant. But hey, does the magnetic force, this, 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 this magnetic force, will it change as the speed changes? Yes, because the thing is the particle, you know, you are letting it go from rest. Do you see that I, what I do, I'm doing is I'm letting it go from rest and then the gravitational force is going to make it go, okay, that might not be a magnet. But the, so in that case, basically, in that case, you basically have this. So if it was non-magnet, Basically what you have is just mg, so you have F net is equal to mg is equal to ma, so your acceleration here is mg over m which is g. So in this case it's definitely 9.8 meters per second square, right? On the other hand, uh, on the other hand, in the, in the case that we are talking about, there are two contributions. Now this contribution does depend upon the speed. Do you remember the magnetic force will, you know, I mean this thing will depend upon how fast the thing is changing. As gravity pulls it down, it will go faster, 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 faster and that magnetic force keeps, the repulsion keeps increasing, increasing, increasing. There will be a point at which the repulsion might become equal to mg and if it becomes equal, at that point you have achieved what is called terminal velocity. Does that make sense? Because in order to achieve, so I'm just saying that when you achieve terminal velocity, F net will become equal to zero and what you have is mg will become equal to F of b. This is the only thing that depends upon velocity. This one doesn't because this depends upon how fast the, you know, the thing is moving, you know, how fast the flux is changing. You know, it's like what you had learned in, uh, does it remind you kind of of what you had learned in physics one about the air resistance force? You know, in air resistance force, for example, the force itself depends upon velocity. Do you remember the air resistance force actually depends upon the drag force, depends upon velocity? And for example, if, you, if your cat, for example, by mistake fell from the, your house, from the, from the window of your house, whether it will achieve terminal velocity or not will depend upon several factors, you know, like, I mean, for, for, for example, you know, how high, 
you know, if it fell from the seventh floor or something, it's possible that it will achieve terminal velocity. And in fact, oftentimes people say that above a certain height might be better for the cat because if it achieves terminal velocity, it may not be as scared. It may have time to kind of spread its body out because the large, you know, or or and and land in a posture which is much more, uh, you know, safe for it. But I think people estimate that cats can actually survive the fall from say six to seven floor. Please don't try this at home, <laughs> you know, and and they come out safe. And the thing is, and part of the reason is that F net on the cat becomes zero after a certain time if it's falling from a very high building because mg becomes equal to the drag force and drag force actually does depend upon the speed. On the other hand, mg doesn't. Do you remember that from physics one? Just look at your textbook a few chapters ago, chapter six or five or something. Any questions about this folks? Anybody? All right, let me say one thing. You know, I want to point your, uh, you know, draw your attention to this word called eddy currents. What is the meaning of the word eddy current? Do you know? Okay, have you heard this word eddy currents? No? Okay, eddy current is actually a word that is often used to really mean nothing else but induced current that we are talking about. You know these induced currents that we talk about here, this induced current that we are talking about, that's what people call eddy current except you use the word eddy current if these induced currents are in a material which is not really a well defined, doesn't have a well defined path like a wire. So you know for example, if suppose I take a metal plate, if I take a metal plate right and uh, I bring a magnet close to the metal plate, I take it far away from the metal plate, like here, this thing, this is made with, with metal. If I take the magnet close to it and far from it, close to it, uh, far from it, do you think there must be some induced current there as well? It's metal, it has free electrons, don't you think those free electrons will feel a force and they'll do something? Yeah, they will. And so the thing is, there will be current induced and the current that will be induced will be given by Lenz's law, the direction of current for example how large the magnitude of, of the current is, again you can find using this, the direction of current will be given by Lenz's law. So again exactly the same thing that we, will do, we are doing for wire. The only thing is that the current doesn't have a well defined path to, to flow. So what does current do? It flows in little eddies or little whirlpools, you know the meaning of the word eddy in English is whirlpools, little vortices. And so the current doesn't have a well-defined path, so it flows everywhere, but in the direction that is given by Lenz's law, everywhere. And that is what is called eddy current. You can even call this current here, since it's, it's not as well-defined, it's not like a little thin wire. But again, you can say that the direction of induced current here, as the thing is going, is going to be given by Lenz's law, and you can call it eddy current. Or if you have a metal plate, right? And if you're trying to t think about uh, what will happen, look, look at this thing here. I have, this is a magnet here, right? And this is a metal plate. Do you think if I let go and it passes through this magnet, as it's getting closer to the magnetic field, wouldn't there be this, these currents induced in this? And again, this will be eddy current because if you look, it doesn't have very well-defined path for it to flow, right? But it'll be flowing everywhere. And so this, let's, let's see what will happen due to this eddy current. Can you expect, uh, tell me what will happen? You know, typically this thing would have swung like a pendulum, right? And for a while you would have seen it going back and forth. But now because of this repulsion that we have been talking about, what do you think will happen? Will the motion get damped out easily? Let's try. See, do you see how quickly it dies? The motion dies actually? It dies much more quickly than, for example, if I had, if I didn't have this magnet close to it, if, if it was just hanging like this, it would be going for a while, right? On the other hand, this current induced in this, these eddy currents induced in this thing really, sorry, thwart the motion and it damps out pretty fast. You know, in some cases, these, this damping due to eddy currents, due to induced current may not be so bad. In some cases, it may be bad. For example, in a transformer, you try to avoid these eddy currents. So you laminate these things with uh, some insulating materials and things to make sure that eddy currents are minimized, etc. On the other hand, uh, on the other hand, in some cases it could be good. For example, in your car, 
you know, car, if you're going on a very rough road, you know, road which has a lot of bumps and things, the car could be jumping up and down and that's not good for your car. So you might have something that actually tries to damp it out using this mechanism of damping, where the, there is a magnet through which something is passing and that actually damps out the motion so that the car's motion is not as jerky. So the point is this damping mechanism is not always bad. It could be good in some application, bad in some cases. You have to see which situation it is. Does that make sense? Okay, all this time we have actually talked about macroscopic way. That means, you know, a very um, global way of thinking about what happens. But I haven't really told you, for example, how, why should the electrons in that wire feel a force when I bring a magnet close to it? Or why should they you know, feel a force in one direction versus the other direction when I take the magnet far from it? So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a really nice example that will show to you this microscopic or this, you know, this reason you know, where you can actually see that yes, electrons will feel a force. And this will be based upon everything that you already know. So, tip, so really, there's nothing new, but at least you're going to see a very nice example right now of how you can actually understand the, the, this induced current. It's, it's not a mystery, it's not magic. It must be due to some real force that the electrons might be feeling. So let me prove to you that that's really the case. And this example is called motional EMF. Okay, so here is the situation. Let's say that we have a metal wire like that, okay, and it's sitting in some magnetic field. Let's say the external magnetic field is pointing into the board. Okay. Let's say that we have, now I have some wire, some rod that I have in my hand. So this is a metal rod. This metal rod is of length L and I am pulling it with my hand with a constant speed V. The first thing that I want to ask you is, is the flux through this loop, do you see that there is a loop here? Look, this is a loop, this is one full circuit, isn't it? Do you think there should be some current induced here? Is there flux through this changing? What is happening to the flux? Is it increasing or decreasing? I want everybody to tell me what should be the direction of induced current in that case based upon Lenz's law. Everybody, one minute, talk to a person next to you. The question is, what should be the direction of induced current in that loop clockwise or counterclockwise? Use Lenz's law. Is the flux through it increasing, decreasing? The coil-like status quo, which way should be the induced magnetic field and hence which way should be the current? Do it. Anybody from the fourth row? Anybody from the fourth row, folks? Folks, anybody from the fourth row, I want your opinion on what, what should happen. Should the current be clockwise or counterclockwise? So please. Counterclockwise? How many people think counterclockwise? Okay, wonderful. So he, his opinion is that the induced current in this loop should be counterclockwise. Let's figure out why it should be counterclockwise. First, first of all, is the flux through this loop increasing or decreasing? Increasing. Remember, flux is defined like this in this case. Flux will be magnitude of the magnetic field, this external magnetic field, which is crosses. This is my magnetic field, which is crosses. This, the magnitude of that times the magnitude of the area of your loop times cosine of the angle between the loop, between the magnetic field and the area vector. Is the magnetic flux increasing or decreasing? Increasing. Why is it increasing? Is the magnetic field changing? No, I'm keeping the magnetic field fixed at whatever value it was, it is a uniform field. Is the theta changing, the angle between the magnetic field which is pointing in and the area vector? Area vector is perpendicular to the area, right? So if this is the area here, you know, length times breadth, the area vector will be perpendicular to that. 
Is the area vector changing? The magnitude of that? No. Sorry, the, the angle theta? No. But is the area vector magnitude changing? Yes, that's what's changing here. Because you can see, as you keep pulling this like this, let's say this distance is x, this x keeps getting bigger and bigger, right? So the area itself is changing, and hence there is a d pi over dt. The flux is changing with time, right? Is everybody agreeing why is b, phi b final different from phi b initial? Because, because the area is not the same both times, right? Okay, so according to Faraday's law, the question is can we find the induced voltage easily in this case? Let's try it. Let's assume that you know this is the, the the area of this thing is A. So first of all, V induced will be, and I'm not caring about the minus sign and things, let's worry about just the magnitude right now. This should be minus D over DT of phi sub B, and phi sub B will be B A cosine theta. Do you see that? dB over dt is 0, d cosine theta over dt is 0, it's only dA over dt that is that matters. And what is A here? Can I write A as x times L? I can, right? So if you like, I can, uh, let me just do it in one line here. This will be x times L. What is changing? It is, is only x changing? Yes. So what I can say is that the induced EMF then is Oh, I'm not going to worry about minus signs. It'll be just, let's pull B out since it's constant. Let's pull L out since it's constant. Since Let's pull cosine theta out since it's constant. It's just going to be D over DT of X. Is, can we give a name to D over D, uh, DX over DT? That's the rate of change of X with time. Isn't that the speed with which I'm pulling? Also, what is theta in this problem that I gave you? You know, isn't the direction of, we can always choose the area vector to be perpendicular in the same direction, perpendicular to the area in the same direction. So do you see the angle between the magnetic field and area vector is zero? So cosine zero is one. So this is cosine zero degrees, which is one. So what we have then is V induced is equal to B L times dx over dt and dx over dt is the speed. So this is the induced voltage. Now here is the thing. Is there another way to get the same exact thing? So this is what we found to be the induced voltage if we used Faraday's law. If we made use of that formula there, that's what we found. But is there a real microscopic way of thinking about it? Let's try it. So we'll try an alternative way to get this thing. By the way, notice if you are given the length of the rod, suppose you were told this length of the rod is one meter. You were told the magnetic field is say one Tesla. You were given that the speed with which we are pulling it is five meters per second. We can find how much is the induced EMF, right? Let's try an alternative way of doing exactly the same problem. And this time I'm going to try a microscopic method. So here is the thing, you know, this, this might seem to you, what is all this, you know, why is that, why do I have this induced voltage? It doesn't make sense. So let's think about why it does make sense. So here is the thing. Now I am going to first not worry about this thing. Let's just think about if you have a cross magnetic field, just like I asked you in that concept test that I gave you today. And if I have a rod of length L, and if I'm moving it with a speed V like this, do you remember which way should it feel a force? It should, should there be a separation of charges? Should electrons go one way and positive charges the other way? Why? Because we know F is equal to Q V cross P. So think about it. So if you put your fingers in the direction of V, cross it in the direction of magnetic field, which is pointing in, you see my thumb is going up. That means positive charges feel a force up. Electrons will go down. Do you see there'll be electrons accumulating here, positive charges here. By the way, these crosses mean magnetic field. 
So do you see there's accumulation of electrons here, positive charges there? Would you call this uh, induced voltage? Wouldn't you call it induced voltage? Is there a voltage induced? Isn't it like plates of capacitors? The separation of charge, what it's doing is it's collecting negative charge here, positive charge here. It's as though we had two different, you know, positive here, negative here. There's a potential difference. There's a voltage. Let's see how big this voltage would be. When the steady state is established, what happens? What do you think is happening? Why are these electrons feeling a force downward, in the downward direction? It's due to this force, right? Now, as more and more electrons go and accumulate there, will, mo will these electrons repel also? Won't they? So as more and more electrons are feeling this magnetic force, as you keep moving this, won't the electrons that are already there repel more electrons that are coming in? And these positive charges will attract them. Another way of saying this is that these, this separation of charge produces an electric field which is pointing down from positive to negative. Do you see that the separation of charge is producing an electric field? Okay, and that electric field will produce a force which is F of E, which is just Q times E. When would you say that equilibrium has been established? Because these electrons are feeling two different kinds of forces. One is the magnetic force due to this external magnetic field, these crosses that is pointing into the board that's trying to push the electrons down due to this force. And the other force that is acting is due to the fact that electrons themselves are repelling each other, the positive charges are attracting. In other words, there is an electric field set up and there is an electric force that's trying to push the electrons up. When will equilibrium be established? Anybody? Equilibrium means no net force, right? That would happen when? Do you see that these electrons are feeling like the two forces? Electric force is pointing which way? Huh? On the, on the electron, so if I draw a free body diagram of an electron, it feels two forces. One is the magnetic force F sub B that is pulling it down. One is the electric force F sub E that is pulling it up. What is equilibrium, folks? Come on, you, all of you know equilibrium. Equilibrium means no net force. That means the electric force must be equal to the magnetic force, shouldn't it? Okay, so that would mean these two forces must be equal in magnitude. So equilibrium would mean that F of B is equal to F of E because this would mean F net on the electrons is zero, on the free electrons is zero. What is the magnitude of this? This will be Q V B times sine 90 and sine 90 is 1 because the, that's the angle between the magnetic field and the velocity vector and that should be equal to Q times E. Notice that Q and Q get cancelled, sine 90 is 1, so what we are left with is V times B is equal to E. Now here is the thing, um, I, maybe I don't want to write the answer in terms of E, I want to write it in terms of V induced because I want to compare and see is this microscopic way of thinking about things in which I'm thinking about forces on these little electrons, is that going to give me the same answer for V induced as what we got here using some, you know, formula that Faraday came up with or not? Because this is doing it from basics, right? So tell me how to relate this electric field to the induced voltage. So there is induced voltage here, right? This the V induced. Let's say the length of this wire is L. The length of this rod is L here, remember? Can you tell me what we based upon what we have learned, what's the relationship between V induced and E? Okay, let me re remind you because we will be able to find recall that you know, delta V was equal to integral E dot TL from initial to final point. Remember, change in potential was related to electric field. Do you remember? If the electric field is constant, we can pull the electric field out, right? And this will become delta V 
is equal to minus E times L. Integral dL will be <coughs> the total length, you know, total distance between the two points where you are trying to find the potential difference, right? Is that making sense? And I do not really care about the minus signs, I am only interested in the magnitudes anyway. So the point is delta V is equal to E times L and this delta V is what we are calling V induced. This is what, this is the thing that we have given a new name, we are calling it V induced. So do you see, I do not need to put these lines around L, Th these are magnitudes. So basically what we are saying is that the electric field is V induced divided by L, right? So can I put it here? Okay, let us try it. So we have V, the speed times the magnetic field is equal to V induced divided by L. Hey, lo and behold, we are getting what we got before. V induced is equal to L V B. This is exactly what we got using Faraday's law, right? So Faraday's law is not magic. It really makes sense. It is a quick way of figuring out exactly the same thing that you would figure out using the microscopics of how electrons are feeling forces due to the magnetic field or the induced electric field, you know, or the, or the electric field that is produced due to the separation of charges, etc. In the end, what you find for V induced is B L V, which is exactly what you had gotten using the quick way of doing things, which is Faraday's law, which says that the induced EMF is d phi over dt. You know, does that at least build some confidence in the fact that Faraday's law is correct? You know, so long as you believe in the definition of ma magnetic force, electric force, and, the, and equilibrium, it makes sense. Now, here is the thing. I want to discuss one more thing before we leave, which is, do you think that if I have a light bulb here in the circuit, suppose I have a light bulb, which is just a resistor, do you think the light bulb will light up if I keep pulling this? It will, right? It will light up, light bulb is lighting up, but the thing is there is no battery in the circuit. How is it, am I getting electrical energy for free? You know electrical energy which is converted into light energy and all sorts of other forms of energy, is it coming for free due to nothing or is there something, go ahead please. Using mechanical energy, so. Very good, you are doing work to really pull this thing and what do you think will happen if, I, if we do not pull it? Suppose I let go of it. I was pulling it and I was making it move at a constant velocity. I was making it move at some constant velocity. This was constant. The thing is if I do not pull it with my hand, what do you think will happen? It will stop. Why will it stop? Can you think about what force is acting? You know, so, so there is a force of the hand. The thing is there must be some force that must be opposing it, what is that force that is opposing it? Because if this thing is moving at a constant velocity, remember from Newton's first law, any object that is moving at a constant velocity must not have any net force on it. So if I am pulling it with the force F of H, there must be some force in the opposite direction. Why do you think there is a force in the opposite direction? Go ahead please. If it stops, it has to be force in the opposite direction. Yeah, the, uh, the, uh, the force in the opposite direction is due to the fact that there is this induced current in it. And by the way, we can find I induced very easily from V induced by just saying that I induced is just V induced divided by R, where R is the resistance of this whole circuit. Now if we ignore the resistance of the rest of the copper wire, then it is the resistance of this light bulb, right? Okay, but the thing is, let us think about why would this wire feel a force? Do you remember this? F on a magnetic force on a current carrying wire was this I L cross B, right? Which way is this wire feeling a force if it is this, this, this rod of length L? Which way is it feeling a force? Let us do it L cross B. Put all of your fingers of your right hand in the direction of induced current, right? This I is I induced and cross it in the direction of external magnetic field. Do you see my thumb is pointing this way? Is everybody seeing that? I 
induced cross B, B external is all crosses, so you can see my thumb is pointing that way. So this is really this magnetic force due to the current. Let us call it B sub I or something so that to remind us that this is the magnetic force on the current carrying rod. These are subscripts. So this magnetic force is the one that is keeping it steady, right? And this should that be equal to F sub H? If this thing is to move at constant velocity, yeah. So this force should exactly be equal in magnitude to F sub H if we want this thing to move at a constant velocity. Now what would be the power, the power in this circuit? Can you tell me, just, just tell me what is the power in this circuit? Do you remember that power was defined, power is the energy per unit time, right? And do you remember an, a, energy is related to work done which is F dot D, so power will be F dot D divided by T which is F dot V, would not it be? So what will be the power here? The power that is generated in the circuit due to the work that you are doing with your hand just like what you said is going to be this force, this force is I induced times L times B, I L B times V. What I is, what, what is the I? I we knew, know is this. So I should be, we know V induced divided by R and then we have L B V. But what is V induced? V induced we just now learned using two different methods is just B L V. So let us write it down. This is just B L V and then we have L B V divided by R. I hope you guys were watching me and I have not messed, messed up any of those things. So what we are getting is B square, L square, V square over R. This is the energy, you know, this is the energy per second that we have that can be converted into heat and light here in the resistor. Does that make sense? But it is V, we are doing work per second, this much amount of work that is then getting converted into electrical energy and then getting converted into heat energy, light energy, etc. Have a great day folks, I will see you guys next time. Professor Singh is a lecturer in the physics department at the University of Pittsburgh. For more information about Professor Singh and her research, visit her website in the description below.